Hello, everyone. Uh, thank you so much for joining us today for this Research Week panel discussion, uh, Land Grant R1, Community Over Commercialization. Community Over Commercialization uh, was the theme for Open Access Week this past October. Uh, and it will be the theme for the upcoming Open Access Week this coming October. So I'm so glad that we get to continue this conversation. And there have been so many conversations on campus at many different levels about Utah State University. What is our mission? What are we trying to achieve? And I think that those questions are very much tied back to our identity as a land grant institution and our identity as an R1 research institution. So today we have four panelists joining us from across the university. We have Christy Glass, who is faculty from the Sociology and Anthropology Department and will be facilitating our panel today. Jamie Walters, who's the director of the Transforming Communities Institute. Stephanie Western, who is a collections analyst librarian here at USU Libraries and Noah Langenfeld, a PhD candidate from Plant, Soils, and Climate. But when we talk about being a land grant, I think the first thing we need to hold in our mind is that as a land grant institution, we are very much tied up in the colonial past and present realities of this nation. And so let us do the land grant and hold in your heart this very first line. As a land grant institution, Utah State University campuses and centers reside and operate on the territories of the eight tribes of Utah who have been living, working, and residing on this land from time immemorial. These tribes are the Confederated Tribes of the Goshu Indians, Navajo Nation, Ute Indian Tribe, Northwestern Band of Shoshone, Paiute Indian Tribe of Utah, San Juan Southern Paiute, Skull Valley Band of Goshute, and White Mesa Band of the Ute Mountain Ute. We acknowledge these lands carry stories of these nations and their struggles for survival and identity. We recognize elders past and present as peoples who have cared for and continue to care for the land. In offering this land acknowledgement, we affirm indigenous self-governance, history, experiences, and resiliency of the Native people who are still here today. And with that, I'm going to hand over to Christy Glass, who will be leading our discussion today. We'll have plenty of time for questions uh, after the panel, so if you have anything you would like to discuss further, um, hold it in your mind, and I promise you'll have an opportunity to put your questions to the panel or share your own thoughts afterwards. Erica, thank you so much for organizing the panel and thank you all for being here today. It feels really important to be talking about these issues right now and I appreciate your making space and bringing these awesome folks together from very different parts of our campus to think through these things collectively. Um, I think we all recognize we're at a real inflection point at our institution, um, in our state and across the country in terms of the future of higher education and the role of higher education in uh, American society and democracy. So I'm really grateful that we have this space. Thank you so much, Erica. So I'll ask questions, um, and, and for most of the questions, I'll kind of um, uh, identify one of you to, to start us off. Um, but with the first question, I think this is something that, that we're all thinking about and grappling with. So I'll ask all of you, we'll just go down the road if that's okay with the first question, which is uh, our new president, uh, President Cantwell, has prioritized accessible and high quality education that equips students with the skills and knowledge needed to succeed in the modern workforce. We're also getting messages from UCHI that our goal is increasingly uh, workforce readiness, right? Um, that, that our that our goal is kind of shifting or, or increasingly focusing on that. For each of you, what makes an education high quality and accessible? And what do you see as USU's current opportunities and challenges in this area? And we'll start with you, Jamie. So thinking about um, high quality, 
Um, I think that when we're talking about, you know, we all we're coming from different disciplines, but some of the things that are, you know, we can think about are in common across disciplines. Um, the idea of infusing um, critical thinking into all of our classes, ensuring that students have those um, opportunities to think about um, really the, the issues that they're studying and challenging them to, to think about the different aspects of what they're studying and how it connects back to um, historical aspects, to current day issues, um, making sure that, that we're infusing all those things within the, the, the things that we're teaching. In terms of accessibility, um, I think in many cases, we're, we're, we're tr academia, higher ed is a very traditional type of approach, right? Where we've done this thing, we've done it the same way always, and this works, so why would we change it? Um, and that's not, that's not what community, that's not what uh, students are saying that they want, right? That um, we need to do something different. And so I'm thinking about um, even just barriers to, to education, things like gen eds. Um, you know, sometimes we have a very rigorous, um, you know, this is, these are the gen eds we have to take or to be able to do this. And when and the reality is, is why? Um, so I'm, we're co I'm constantly asking, like, why? why? Why do we need to do this? So thinking about, can we be flexible in the decisions that we're making? Um, around requirements for students and, the, and the, the things they have to do to attain their degree. Um, do they really have to take those classes or could, they, could it be something different that would inform um, the career path that they want to take? Um, and then also about sort of those um, ancillary supports where, um, you know, do our students have housing? Do our students have food to eat? Do they have childcare so they can come to class? Do they have appropriate transportation? Um, those are, you know, societal, society level issues, community level issues, but those are all things that impact the students' ability to access education. That was so good, thank you. Um, so when I, when I think about that question of, you know, what makes an education high quality, what makes it accessible, you know, some of the things that Jamie already touched on, but uh, I thought definitely about the affordability aspect. Is it accessible if you can't actually? And then we know our students are experiencing food insecurity. This is not a, a secret and it's not new. Um, you know, I also thought about the idea of, you know, is it physically accessible? Can they get into the spaces? Do they have access to the infrastructure and the technology that they need to actually access the learning materials? Um, another thing I thought about, uh, and this is probably just from my perspective with the library and being focused on the collections, um, are we able to provide the quality of resources, learning resources that students need to do their work and to do their learning and to do their research? And not only that, but are we part of the educational process of teaching them how to interact and engage with information, especially when that landscape changes so quickly and as new tools you know, come, come about? Uh, the last thing I thought about with accessibility is um, we're a statewide university. How often is our instruction culturally relevant, culturally sensitive? Is it preparing students to work in all of the different fields that they might uh, be getting ready to work in? And one of the examples that I thought of is from the Rural Department, Christy, where you have Charlie Bales down at the social at the, the social work, um, the social work department down in Blanding, who and her indigenous social work students have not been able to pass, have had a lot of difficulty in passes, passing the licensing exam, which is really harming their ability to serve in their communities, their ability to advance in their careers, and it's because the exam is not written to be culturally competent. It's not written, you know, it's just written to some imaginary, standard, generic graduate. And so she's doing excellent work and the library is trying to support her in that and actually preparing for specific students. And, you know, as principles of universal design tell us, she may be writing it for one specific set of students, but then there are students from all over the world with all of their own unique challenges saying, oh my gosh, can I use this too? This will help me. My challenges are not the same, but I am struggling as well. This could help me. So, those are my initial thoughts.
look at thoughts so far. I'm going to kind of share my perspective, um, I guess, as a current student. So as I mentioned, I'm, I'm a current graduate student. I haven't taken classes for a couple semesters, um, but I've taken many classes in my time, both as an undergrad and as a graduate. Um, and currently, I actually teach a class um, in the plant cells and climate department on hydroponics. Um, this is my third semester teaching that class. Um, I was collaborating with my major professor, and we identified a need in our department, an interest um, in hydroponics, and he kind of gave me the reins and said, hey, teach this class. So I went for it, um, and three semesters in, I've, I've learned a lot about not necessarily only how to teach, but more or less what students want to be taught. Um, the type of quality of education they're kind of seeking when they come to the university. Um, I'm sure you can remember even when you were younger, your, your favorite types of classes were ones where you either got to go on field trips or people see things in the real world or really get hands-on um, experience. And we see that time and time again with our students. Um, we even teach some classes down at our research greenhouses specifically so our students are able to have um, those hands-on experiences. We get feedback in course surveys um, that they want to actually be working with plants not just learning about plants, but they want to be um, seeing these systems um, in the real world, not just learning about them in the real world. Um, and I appreciate that, that too, with some of my favorite classes, um, things that I've done at the university were hands-on learning experiences. Um, now, as an instructor myself, I realize that that is a, a very large workload for instructors to be able to put on that, that high quality of things. I'm creating laboratory exercises creating hands-on things, even just in lecture, um, is, is a lot of work, there's, there's no doubt about that. Um, but to see um, the, the epiphanies from the students when they're um, learning about those things, to be able to work hands-on, it really kind of um, helps them learn in a different way, right? Like everyone learns um, at different rates and different learning styles, and not everyone can just sit in a lecture for five hours a day and um, absorb information. Some people can, and that's great, you know, a lot of students. Um, so switching it up, having um, types of hybrid classes, um, in person, some online, um, but being able to kind of show um, that we can take these opportunities um, beyond the classroom is something that's really, um, we found is really helpful to our students in our department, in our college in particular. Well, thank you so much. I, I really appreciate the thoughtfulness of each of your of your responses from Jamie, you know, I heard this idea that we need to be flexible, um, and no, I heard that we need to be creative. And Steph, you talked about you know the real needs of, of particular students or groups of students, and you know, I just want to you know kind of name the elephant in the room. I think as researchers, as practitioners, as faculty and staff and students, we know um, we know that there are real accessibility challenges for specific groups of our students. And I think, you know, um, and, and our ability to design creative and flexible and adaptive targeted programs is increasing, has been significantly limited by our legislature this year. Um, and I know that troubles me deeply and profoundly and troubles many of us very deeply. And, and you know, the, the one thing that gives me hope is that um, this will require us to be solidaristic and collaborative and creative in thinking about in, in kind of remaining steadfast in our commitment to accessibility for all students um, even within the new the new restrictions that we face going forward um, I don't know what that looks like yet but I you know I feel like we have um, partners across the campus where we can continue to, to collaborate and figure out what that looks like because we must. <laughs> we must. Our, I, I, I would even argue that, that it's an existential issue for our institution, for our institution co to continue to contribute in meaningful ways. We must find ways to support um, the students who have historically not found um, our institution a welcoming and, and inclusive place. Um, so thank you. So the next question uh, concerns the tensions between um, research excellence and our land grant mission. Uh, as many of you know, USU became a Carnegie One research institution in 2022. Um, the prior year in 2021, USU received um, over $368 million in grants. Um, in 2022, we received over $390 million in grants. 
But the question is, how can USU balance the pursuit of research excellence, which we are committed to, uh, um, at particularly the increasingly profit-driven commercialization of research with the mission of the land grant? And, and actually, um, Noah, I'd like to start with you he, uh, on this question. You can pass this, this microphone. Um, you've worked on governmental and private grant projects, um, I, I, and I'd love to hear and I know from the nature of your work, um, you are also committed to the land grant mission and serving, um, serving the state and, and contributing to the state in meaningful ways. How do you see this tension and, and how do you see a, a potential resolution of the tension? Yeah, this is a really good question. Um, I guess the, the first couple days that I actually started uh, my graduate career here at USU, um, so I emerged from Wisconsin and did my undergrad there, but never really, I mean, I did some undergraduate research project, but never was really kind of involved um, on grants and funding agencies at a larger level. Um, and I asked my major professor, I'm like, hey, is it okay if I like take a picture of what I'm doing and like send it to my parents because they're curious? <laughs> I'm like, I didn't know, I'm like, I'm working. Um, we, so we work with um, USDA um, and NASA in particular in our lab, so both um, federal agencies. Um, and he's like, oh yeah, of course, absolutely. Um, we're, we're not doing any secretive things here. Uh, it's, we're a public land grant institution. He literally used those exact words, we're a public land grant institution. Um, it's, it's our duty, we are bound by the legislature um, to share the information here um, that we find. Now, I realize that's not the case necessarily with um, every um, park here on campus. Um, we have a lot of DOE projects here. Um, in our space dynamics laboratory in particular, um, they're not necessarily able to freely share their research um, all the time. Um, but, but for a, a, lot of, a lot of people, um, we just want to get the information out there. Um, that's what kind of the public sees the university as. Um, they see it as a body of knowledge and look for trying to um, help the state um, and help the country um, kind, of, kind of in a larger, larger aspect. Um, so our mission in particular, in our lab and um, our department um, in particular, um, is that we want to get that information out there. Um, trying to grow the best wheat or the best corn isn't necessarily um, the most um, secretive information. Um, you can make it secretive if you ask certain um, several large companies, um, which we always um, we have thoughts that go back and forth on that and information sharing and stuff like that. Um, but for the most part, the general principles, we want to be able to help, help our constituents, right? We always kind of think back to who, who's funding our research, right? For the most part, um, it's either the federal or the state government, and who funds the federal or the state government, well, all of us do. Um, so we want to be able to have those deliverables um, for our constituents, um, whether that um, means uh, presenting at conferences, whether that means giving talks um, in local community events, um, or giving them open houses, or, or um, allowing new tours so these um, at our research greenhouses, we probably give at least one tour a week to all different kinds of groups, um, whether that's elementary school kids, uh, whether that's FAA groups, whether that's interested students um, here at USU. Um, so we're happy to share what we're working on. Um, we also have um, portions of our research that are privately funded, um, not necessarily through federal grants. Um, so people make private donations um, to our department, to our laboratory, um, to have us research their interests um, than necessarily. Now, that's not saying that no one else can um, access that information at all, uh, but we kind of give them a layout. We say, we kind of work with them and say, what do you want to see out of this research? Um, what kind of things will help you um, with your company or with your program? Um, how can we help you? And they kind of help us, um, they, they help guide our, our research, essentially. Um, so we have um, direct involvement of our stakeholders um, in our research design, not necessarily our experimental design, but kind of what questions um, do they want answered. Um, we find that to be a, a really um, mutually beneficial relationship um, between the university and those um, private partners. Yeah, and, and, and Jamie, you have both have research expertise in nonprofit organizations, um, and, and you have done uh, uh, lots of funded work and project projects, and you have extensive community engagement experience um, in service of the land grant mission. How do you see this tension? Well, a lot of thoughts. Um, <laughs> this 
is something I feel like I talk about every day. Um, one of the things I think that we have to keep in mind when we're doing the work that we do, I, I don't think it matters what discipline that we're in, is that ensuring that we're meeting the needs of the communities that we're in. Um, I think academia, part of the reputation that we get is that, that we pursue things that are of interest to us. And, and then we also um, perceive ourselves as the experts. And, and so that really turns off people in communities who really need the resources that we have and may not may feel intimidated or do not want to work with us because of, the, because of those types of attitudes. Um, so as we're thinking about our research agendas, um, does this really meet the needs of, of communities that we're in? Um, going back to the land grant mission that we have, um, is, this really, is this really a need? Um, because we're investing resources into this research agenda. The university is doing that. The tax dollars are doing that. So it's important that we're actually asking that question. Um, are we meeting those needs? Um, some other thoughts that I had, um, you know, I, I, as a social scientist in social work, um, nonprofit research is, is where my main line of research is, but doing a lot of social issue type of work, LGBTQ issues, DV issues, homelessness, housing, um, that research is not profitable. It doesn't make money. Um, I struggle to bring in funding for that type of work. I've been lucky that um, I'm in the College of Communities and Social Sciences, that our college has invested in the Transforming Communities Institute and the work that I do so that we can serve the needs of the communities around the state. But it doesn't make money. So thinking about that, knowing that we get millions and millions of dollars invested into the university through other avenues, funding um, these amazing projects that are incredibly innovative and uh, just incredible uh, to, to hear about and that most of the time I don't understand. Um, but I, that's amazing. But can we then filter resources to things, to these um, needs that maybe don't make as much money? Um, can we reallocate resources so that so, so we can do this meaningful work that's connected to the blind grant mission. Um, and then the, I think the other piece of this that's it's interesting that's been coming up for us in the past couple of months, really, is um, inviting social scientists to tables where they haven't usually been invited. Um, so, you know, in more of the physical sciences realm, um, I sometimes, use, sometimes you hear the phrase hard science, hard science. Um, I try to stay away from that, but just really thinking about making space for social scientists at, at, at the table for this kind of work. Um, I just met this morning and, and actually yesterday with um, folks in you know, Basin at the Bingham Research Center to talk about how we can plug in um, as social scientists in their um, work with an EPA grant. And um, they talked about you know, the need to involve the community in the work that they're doing around um, you know, air pollution and um, energy work, um, you know, implementing um, you know, things like septic tanks um, in, very, in rural communities, um, thinking about the impact of uh, the energy industry on health and well-being. Um, and, and they talk about, you know, we have the technical expertise, we don't have the expertise in community engagement or working directly with, you know, people. <laughs> so we need you for that. And so I'm so thankful that they um, have, have reached out to us and, and want to make that partnership. And I think more of that has to happen. And But we also have to have the resources, right? Um, I, me, along with other people who are doing this kind of work, can't um, work on 30 projects with no funding. Um, we have to be able to pay our students. We have to be able to, you know, um, if we need to buy other courses if we, or if we need to hire other researchers to participate, we have to have resources to be able to do that. So. Those are just some of my thoughts. So please uh, uh, talk to us about your perspective from where you sit in USU libraries. Sure, happy to. Uh, so again, this is a different a different tack. I think it relates. Um, I feel like in some ways the R1 designation has been a bit of a double-edged sword. I mean, you know, here you have space dynamics bringing in what two thirds of of that money. But now we have this R1, this, this crown, this halo, and I think it, it increases expectations for the university. I, I feel like it increases expectations for um, what the library should be able to provide to researchers, to students. And kind of like you said, 
it's not like people are, are coming to us and saying, you seem like you don't have enough money. Would you like more of the money? <laughs> yeah, they don't. Um, what happens instead is that we have flat budgets. This year, we aren't even going to get um, the normal assistance that we would get to help with uh, journal inflation. So, you know, the publishers, they're making their money. They're doing just fine. And they're raising costs all the time. So we are in this position of having to say, well, we don't have the same kind of budget that other R1 institutions have. We can't provide the same level of resources. If anything, we need to cut resources because we can't keep up with the rising costs. And then we have to make decisions that make people really upset. And they think, well, I'm at an R1 institution. You should have this. The U has this. Why don't you have this? But yeah, shocker, we're not. Uh, the same as the new. Um, so one opportunity that I do see there would be is uh, if USU is able to continue to invest in open. So invest in open access, in open educational resources, in uh, reminding people of their, their right to deposit their research in USU's institutional repository to make it um, you know, open and available to you know, people outside the USU community. So that you know these projects that are being funded with you know grants from wherever can um, be shared with the communities who would benefit from them. So those are my thoughts. Thank you so much. I uh, uh, even more than the first question. What a diversity of kind of perspectives about what this looks like at USU. Um, I'm really appreciative of of Jamie you're acknowledging the critical importance of so much of the research that we do that is not profitable. Um, and, and Steph, the double-edged sword of the R1 designation, I feel that certainly in my discipline where um, you know, so much of the uh, foundational work in my discipline, so much of the critical work in my discipline um, is simply not commercializable, right? Uh, or, or, or competitive for large private um, corporate grants. And thank goodness, thank goodness, right? That's, that's a, a value. Um, to the institution that we have critical work, uh, I, I would cons I would classify my own research as very corporate critical. <laughs> I actually study corporations from a very critical perspective, and to the extent that I would have to make my research attractive to corporate sponsors, um, would would negate the importance of why I do the work, right? Um, and I think what we're living in is. Uh, in incredible contradiction where public investment in public education has been declining for many decades or you know, many years, multiple decades. Um, and then to fill in the gap, uh, faculty are expected to find ways to commercialize their research, right? To bring in big dollars. And I think that, that, that misses so much of the rich work that makes a university important and vital in a democracy. Um, it, it's exactly the work that isn't commercializable, I believe, that, that um, makes the work, uh, makes the uh, university such a precious and, and important place in a democratic society. In my own department, since we've, since we've received um, R1 designation, uh, we've seen massive cuts in graduate funding, um, massive cuts in travel funding for faculty and graduate students, massive declines in resources um, for researchers and and it, it is it is um, and the message being if you want those good things that you used to have you have to bring in big dollars to fund them um, and and for many of our disciplines I'm thinking of the social sciences and certainly the humanities that is just not a, a sustainable uh, model that can enrich the institution moving forward um, we, we, we we need, again, the creativity, the collaboration to, to rethink um, some of these priorities and, and what it means to be bringing in um, millions of dollars in grant funding and not being able to fund uh, graduate students or research assistants or, or community rich community, high impact community engaged work. So thank you um, for your comments. Um, we now turn to community engagement. Um, community engagement, collaboration, our recurring themes in our collective discussions about the future of USU. Um, 
for each of you, what strategies can USU employ to measure, assess, and reward the impact of our community-engaged efforts, ensuring that we effectively address societal challenges and promote economic development? And Jamie, I'll, I'll toss it to you um, as the director of the Transforming Communities Initiative. What are you doing through TCI, and where are the opportunities to expand our collective community impact? So I think it's important to first acknowledge that what community engagement means, um, because I, there are a lot of different definitions of, of this. Um, you know, community. So if we're doing true community engaged work, the community is a part of every step of our process, and from the time that we start thinking about research or designing a solution, they're there at the table, informing that process, and they are participating in designing the study or or collecting data etc so um, it's not at it's not um, I go into a community and I collect data and therefore I'm doing community engaged work it doesn't mean that your work isn't valuable it's but it's not community engaged and that it's community based you're doing work about the community that's great it's needed but it's different so that I think it's important to make that distinction um, the other thing I want to mention that I didn't mention before, but I think it's important to think about again why this is a, why community engaged work is important to the university. You know, of course, land like grant mission we talk about it all the time, but the community encompasses our students. So when we think about well, you know, we hear sometimes that higher ed it's it's, it's a product or we're selling something now. There's so much competition, and so we have to make sure that. The ed, that our, what we're offering is attractive to students. Um, yes, and uh, also think about that if we don't address community issues, um, those impact our students too. Um, I mean, I, I, as social worker, always go back to, to basic needs because you know that's at the bottom of the pyramid, right? Um, if they don't have house, a house, they don't have food, they don't have Healthcare, et cetera, those are all things that impact their ability to access what we do as instructors or other types of things that we do on campus. So I think it's important to realize that we have to do this work because it does impact our students more broadly. Um, and then I think thinking about how we reward faculty to continue to do and staff to continue to do this type of work. Um, you know, you mentioned this is not easy, right? Community engaged work takes so much time and energy. Um, it is, uh, any kind of teaching is difficult, but whenever you have to think about um, applying concepts to a, um, something that is real world and then involve partners on a meaningful level and make sure that there's some level of uh, reciprocity, meaning that, um, that our partners that we're working with also benefit from the work that we're doing, that it's not um, completely student-centered, and, and I'm not saying student-centered is a, is a bad thing, it's good, but again, I think if you're community-centered, you're also student-centered. So I don't think it's either or, it's both. Um, and so that work takes, um, that community-engaged approach in a classroom takes so much time and energy. And so, uh, one, resources. Uh, we had a, a TCI hosted a conference um, in Moab, the a conference for uh, community-engaged scholarship and teaching in February, and we had universities from across the state, faculty, staff, students come and, and talk about their community-engaged work. And I mean, you just see the passion and um, excitement that they have for the work that they're doing, but also the time and energy that it takes. It's exhausting. And so, um, but I heard other universities talk about, yeah, we give our faculty um, money to develop community-engaged courses. and um, we also provide grants so that they can um, either pay their community partners or that they, they have money so that they can, you know, do things like do gardens or, um, you know, cre yeah, create service projects or, or whatever, or um, provide incentives to research participants if it's a, re a community research class. And I thought, oh, we should probably be doing that. Um, and we need those things. Um, so again, resources. Um, so faculty really need that. And then I think the other piece of this that's faculty specific is um, we like to use this community engaged um, classification as something that is important to the university, and I, and I really do believe it is, but um, 
it's all it's not always clear to those of us who do this work how it's how it's how it's going to look with the tenure and promotion process. And um, and I know that there's conversations happening around that, and I'm so glad to hear that. But um, until it's uh, written and ensured to the faculty that um, that my work as a community engaged uh, scholar is looked at the same way as someone else who doesn't do it um, and can produce. Um, 100 papers before tenure, um, awesome. I can't do that because my projects take a year to two years and um, it it's involves so many different people and, and there's so many setbacks and, and, and every researcher I think experiences these things, but I can't produce the same amount of outputs um, that others may be able to do. And the other piece of that is the outputs themselves are different. Um, so my work isn't always in a peer-reviewed journal, and in, in my, an output might look like a report that I produced back to a coalition um, or to a nonprofit that we worked with, or it might look like uh, we started a, um, a morning center. You know, it might look like that. Um, how do you measure that um, when you're being evaluated um, on? these more traditional things that academia is known for, these peer-reviewed journal articles, national conference presentations, it doesn't always line up. So am I going to be evaluated the same way as someone else who has those other things? And on paper, they, they look fantastic, and, I, and they are fantastic, but like also the work I do is meaningful and impactful too, and good. So what does that look like? That was so good. Uh, one of the things that I was thinking about as you were talking was that, you know, if if you were ramming your projects through so quickly and, you know, getting the articles and getting the things, you would have done such a bad job at at actually doing an effective and respectful engagement work. Uh, so, yeah, I loved how you brought up the idea of, you know, what this work actually takes. And how do you evaluate it based on other things? Um, one of the examples that we have in the library, and I told her I was going to point at her today, but for me, having kind of a near close seat to watching this happen was um, our digital archivist, Sarah Berry, has been working with the Northwestern Band of the Shoshone with their tribal library, um, you know, as part of a larger group project to help them get uh, their, their digital library items um, you know, curated, sorted, digitized, stored, all the things. But it took, you know, over a year ongoing additional funding to fund her position. Like it takes work to do respectful, responsible, quality community engagement. And it, it also took Sarah, who, as in all things, was a brilliant example of this. Um, you know, she's working with a, a tribal community, with an indigenous community. We are a land grant institution. She had to go in from a position of humility and respect and support and being willing to listen and to learn and hear what do they want, how do they want their um, images described, what kind of language and vocabulary is respectful to them, and not just what the Library of Congress and traditional academia says. She was not there to enforce her own archival standards upon another group. She was there to offer support, and it takes care, and it takes time, and you can't compare it to others. So Jamie kind of hit on a point that I was thinking about as soon as this question came up. Um, that's kind of, how, how, how do we advance necessarily, how do we traditionally advance as academics? Right? The traditional mantra is publish or perish, right? When it looks comes up for promotion or tenure, what do they look at? They look at how, how much grant money you brought in, how many articles you've written, how many citations do you have, simple, simple metrics like that. They don't tell the whole story um, of your work. Um, so how do we shift the departmental thinking or the higher level thinking to be able to um, introduce these ideas um, of being collaborative, collaborative um, or engaging and, and make that part of what we really should be focusing on? I wrote a hundred articles um, since before I was promoted. So what? What was the impact of those articles? How do they actually um, impact my local community? There needs to be, I think, more 
um, emphasis placed on that um, at, at the higher level um, to be able to help us shift away from those, those simple numbers, those simple metrics. Because um, um, as she mentioned, right, it's not a difference between someone in chemistry versus someone in sociology. Um, their path to tenure looks very different. Um, so to be able to hold everyone to the same exact standard, it has to be flexible. Um, we can't necessarily um, just focus on those, those exact numbers. Thank you. I, I love um, each of you touched on the need to have a more expansive understanding of what research is and what it looks like and how it moves forward. And I think that's tremendously valuable. And I know in many of our disciplines, there is this kind of um, grassroots effort to push us toward more critical methodologies, more inclusive methodologies, more inclusive um, definitions of what of what research is, and I'm grateful for that. Um, I also want to I, I, I want to note that the tension between promoting economic development in the state and addressing pressing social problems for me is kind of a false, a false dichotomy. Um, I, I collaborate uh, really closely with an organization in Utah called the Utah Center for Legal Inclusion and we're collaborating on a study of the legal profession and why so many um, LGBTQ plus and BIPOC and, and first gen law graduates leave the state to build their careers elsewhere. Um, we, we have a good sense of why that might be. Um, uh, the legal profession has remained um, uh, has remained demographically the same for the past 10 years. There's been very little movement in terms of, despite the kind of huge increases in the diversity of our, of our law schools, that's not being reflected in the legal career, right? So we want to solve, that's a real problem. Um, and that's both a problem that has to do with inclusion and equity and fairness and justice and has a direct impact on economic development. Because if we can't keep talented professionals in the state, um, that's a brain drain and that's going to harm our ability to grow and develop in the future. Um, so it's, for me, um, the community-engaged work I do is also a constant reminder of the short-sightedness of our legislature who doesn't understand clearly that inclusion work is economic development work, um, that you can't grow economically without being absolutely committed to equity and justice and fairness. Um, and, and the ability of researchers on our public university campuses to inform those efforts, to bring our research and our science to bear on solving real world problems, to the extent that we're, we're limiting that through, through our legislation um, is tremendously short-sighted, and I would say uh, reflects kind of evidence-free um, uh, policymaking. The next question is, in the context of open access, um, open education, and community engagement, how can USU actively contribute to the democratization of knowledge production and sharing, and ensure that the benefits of scholarship are widely accessible and inclusive? And Steph, I, I want to go directly to you on this. The, USU Libraries has done a tremendous job and, and just kind of many years of engaged commitment moving us toward uh, more democratic, the democratization of our, of our resources. Can you talk about that, that work and what that looks like moving forward? I guess, happy to. Um, there's so much to say. I'll try to keep it somewhat uh, brief or not. We'll see. Um, there are so many threads. Uh, so before I was in the collection analyst position, I was the OER program manager for two years. And so that gave me a pretty uh, good intro into you know, some of the open, open education work happening here on campus. And we almost lost it all because uh, my position was funded through soft money. So when I um, moved into a different role, the library did not have money to continue to fund this position, so they didn't have someone who could do outreach among the other universities. They did not have someone who could um, who could shepherd the OER grant program that has benefited you know, so many instructors who are trying to adopt and create open educational resources. 
And it was really, really depressing to think that you know something that we were doing that we knew was helping, that we knew was it was helping instructors, it was helping students, it was um, you know helping a faculty and students at other universities because we could see based on our, our analytics, you know, how often the the learning materials being created by USU faculty and instructors were being incorporated at other universities, were being accessed by other students all over the world. We knew all of this, but we just didn't have the money to keep it going. Um, so the good news was that uh, this year the university decided to um, to contribute funding to be able to be hired for that position, and so I hope that this means that we'll be able to continue um, to help with this. Uh, but so in the in the context of open access, open education, engagement, all the things. Okay, so first I would say we've got to invest more in in open access. We we just do. Um, that should be all it takes, right? Is for me just to say, we've got to do this, so make it happen, make it so. Um, Erica Finch manages um, our open access fund, and she gets so many more requests for money to help with APCs for you know student and graduate student and faculty authors who want to make their work open access, both because open access is the right thing to do, but also because it increases the impact of the work. And so I asked her for some for some stats, okay, here's how it goes. Um, yeah, USU authors pay on average $2,000 to be able to make their work open access publishable. That can be as much as $10,000, depending on where you're trying to publish. So what USU Libraries has been able to provide this last year were, okay, how did it go? Um, okay, at an average of $800 per grant, which was only allowed to cover, I believe, up to 50% of the of the APCs, um, we were able to award 35 grants. That supported 34 graduate and 10 undergraduate authors. Erica, how much money have people asked for that you have not been able to give them? Since April 1st? Mm -hmm. oh, $11,000. $11,000. So, she would <laughs> if she could. We all would. So, that is a thing. Um, you know, we also, uh, invest in transformative or we can publish agreements where you know basically we are paying the publishers so that our faculty can publish in those journals you know without having to pay ABC costs. So you know the publishers publishers are doing fine. They are making their lots and lots and lots of money. They're doing great. And but there are also you know some publishers out there who want to be able to to use a different model. You know, aside from the, okay, we have to charge you APCs, or okay, well, then we have to charge the university so that their faculty can publish open access in here. And so that's one of the things that I really like to look into. Maybe that is going to be the way forward, is that we can, you know, try to collaborate on some different publishing models that might help with this. Um, also, well, the librarians all know. Did all of you know that... Um, because of USU policy, what was it, 586, that just about anything that gets published by USU students or USU employees can be placed open access in the digital repository and digital comments. Yeah, okay, see, everyone knows. We need to make sure everyone knows and is doing it. Students, grad students, faculty, everyone, do it. We can do this. Um, I had a couple of thoughts. What were they? Oh yeah, just continue to invest in OER. But this also kind of goes back to what other people are saying. Faculty are being asked to do so much. How does the extra time and work that it takes to create or to adapt open resources for the benefit of their students, for the benefit of their instruction, how does that translate in the promotion and tenure process? Does it? If the most that they can get is some help from the library and maybe a $1,500 grant, that's not, <laughs> that doesn't, that doesn't recognize the work that it takes. Um, so we can do more there, I think. The university can help us invest in more. Also supporting open pedagogical practices is another thing that we can be doing. Like we see the benefit this has to students. We see, you know, the ways that instructors are able to, to tailor the learning to the students, make it more and make it more you know, real life applicable. Um, 
that's all I'm going to say right now. Mm -hmm. I may have other thoughts and like gain the microwave from someone, but <laughs> probably, I probably won't. Mm -hmm. Oh, I talk about this all day. <laughs> it could be a whole course on publishing and open access. Um, my advisor and I probably talk about this at least once a week. Um, we'll that be in a multiple of our discussions. Um, but just to highlight a few things. One, yes, digital commons. Um, everyone should put stuff on digital commons. Digital commons is great. Um, digital commons is searchable by Google. It counts for your Google Scholar citations, right? Um, and most of all, it's free. It's, it's free. It's, we're not paying these, um, yeah, that two, some, some $2,000 average, I'd say that's pretty accurate. Um, for the biological science, that's a little on the low side. I think we're paying even more than that um, for a, an open access article, three, sometimes $4,000. Um, why should we be paying that much if we can put something on digital commons? free and it's just easily as searchable um, and cited um, sometimes as much um, as a regular journal article. Um, it should be it should be no brainer. We should place more emphasis um, on that type of thing. Yes, we have to spend the extra hour to format um, the article ourselves, but it is that worth the four thousand dollar charge to a for profit company. Um, I mean that's that's the other thing too, right? There's there's different models of publishing. There's for profit, um, there's non profit, there's society based publishing. Um, so think about that too. Um, all of those that offer their own models and all offer their own open access kind of ideas. Um, but where necessarily do you want to put your research dollars? Do you want to put them towards the for profit publishing, or do you want to put them back into maybe a society that's closely related to what you're working on um, that's going to help you know is going to help use that money. Um, the science that you really care about. Um, so yeah, we're in our lab in particular. We're trying to shift more and more towards putting things um, on on digital commons, um, mainly because it's also it's, it's a lot easier for us. Um, what's what's the drawback here? Um, we don't go through the same type of peer review process necessarily. Sure, we can do like a college review process um, to put stuff on digital commons, um, but that's so if someone asks me, or someone, I've never heard anyone think that, uh, oh, the digital commons, that's not peer reviewed, I don't trust that. No, I've never heard that from anyone. Um, they say, oh, it's not digital commons, I can get this right now for free. Sweet, send me the link. Um, there's different people value that peer review process differently. And yeah, no doubt about it, the peer review process um, is beneficial and helpful. Um, but is it worth it for us paying multiple thousands of dollars for profit companies? Even think that was, that was and then what is what's the public perception of that? Um, does the public care that? Does the public even know that because this article was in the specific journal of this peer review? I'm not sure the answer to that question. Um, but yes, um, absolutely pro digital comments um, for sure. Um, I'll stop there. So first, let me say I love our librarians. Yes. You are amazing. Um, also, like, love digital comments. It's like one of my favorite things of the month to get the digital comments report to see how many times my papers were downloaded and where. Like, I'm like, oh, the map. Like, oh, somebody downloaded my, my work in France. Cool. Um, so I definitely use that. But in terms of thinking about access, um, I really just, <laughs> it was eye-opening to me. Um, I, I, I did my PhD training at an R1. Um, in, in social work, so you know we're community oriented anyway, um, and we have these we have our code of ethics that say that um, we that if you're a practitioner, you should be using evidence to guide your practice. Well, um, if evidence is peer reviewed journal articles, peer reviewed studies, or peer reviewed information, and that information sits behind a paywall, and you're a social worker who makes $40,000 a year, I mean, really, if that's probably a couple years in, if you're starting out, probably more like $32,000 a year, um, are you really going to be able to pay $150 for an article to better serve your client? No. Um, so that is not talked about um, in, during your PhD studies. So you, you weren't lived by this publisher parish idea, even as a PhD student. 
um, because you're going on the market. So that wasn't something I really even thought about until I got here. And then, you know, my work focuses around nonprofits, which as we all know, especially the ones I work with are human service oriented, have no money, and are struggling to meet the needs of their clients. Um, so I, when I got here, I, I met uh, with nonprofits in uh, some of the rural communities I was interested in working in. And, um, you know, we, I talked about some of the research, the capacity building research I've done, um, and, and shared some of that. And so one of them said, that's great. Um, I looked you up before we, before I came to this meeting, um, but I couldn't access your articles. That was eye-opening for me. So um, that, at that moment, I took a step back and really thought about, like, why am I doing this? Who is this meant for? And so that really changed the path for me in terms of how I approach publishing. Um, so uh, Rachel Wyszkowski, who's not here anywhere, uh, uh, in the library, uh, she was our librarian for social work, and I met with her to talk about what journals exist that are open access that don't have APCs, because I don't have any money. <laughs> I'm, I'm brand new. Um, I'm just a professor, I don't have any money. Um, and APCs are, you know, two to four thousand um, dollars. And for my work, there was like two. Two journals. Which, by the way, aren't high impact. Um, and so coming from an R1, you know, they're saying, you need to publish in high impact journals, you're not going to get tenure if you don't do this. And I'm like, oh, yeah, you know, I want to get tenure. Um, and because that's what you're told to care about, right? And so um, it was really frustrating to like know that the people that I serve or the people that should be reading my work can't read it, but also I'm potentially penalized for not publishing anything in journals that the people that need it can't read. Um, so all that to say, um, uh, when I thinking about this and the work that we do with Transforming Communities Institute, same kinds of things come up. Um, we worked with Erica on starting um, an open access journal, peer reviewed, um, that focuses on disseminating information to community leaders and practitioners who are interested in infusing evidence-based processes into their communities. So we just started that. Our first article was published uh, two days ago, I think. <laughs> yeah. so, um, so we're starting to get submissions, and that's so great. And it's you know multidisciplinary, transdisciplinary. We're encouraging community um, practitioners, um, you know, people who are doing work to address social issues to publish in this space uh, because I mean their voices matter as well. Um, but also academics, um, students, faculty, staff to 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 go down this path. It is peer reviewed, but it's not high like not high. Impact. It's not it does a high have a high impact factor. And so uh, part of this work too is convincing the people who are in charge of those decisions around tenure and promotion that that doesn't matter. Uh, let's think about what that means. Um, and so, so I mean, we have some work to do on our end too, but I just want to say thank you to our librarians for encouraging us to go down that path and also for our community partners and practitioners for really calling us out for that kind of um, practice and helping us understand that, that our, we really need to use our resources differently and use our time differently and make sure that, that the work we do is impacting the work that they do. Yeah, again, you know, what I'm hearing, that the, one of the threads I'm hearing is the need for a much more ex expansive model of what counts as research, what counts as academic publishing. Um, the irony that, that journals are designated as high impact that are exactly the journals that are not accessible to our communities. Um, I think that's a misuse of the word impact, for example. Um, uh, and, and, you know, just to echo what you said, Jamie, the need for our, you know, for our tenure committees to really understand the kinds of work faculty do um, and why they do, the values that inform why they do it, and to, and to have the tenure process reflect um, uh, that, 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 that set of values. But also, I would say, um, recruitment, retention of faculty, um, evaluation of faculty at all levels, right, must recognize that recruiting faculty to do high-impact, community-engaged work that extends our land-grant mission 
means that we may not have the same kind of CVs that, that faculty um, and non-land grant uh, mission institutions have. I would also echo um, what Noah said about um, the deeply flawed model of academic publishing in which large for-profit publishing companies are gatekeepers for what counts as academic research. And that, um, that problematic role of for-profit um, publishing companies has come into sharp relief in my field. In the past two, uh, six months, two critical journals in my field, Theory and Society, which is the flagship journal for theory in my discipline, and Gender, Work, and Organization, which is one of the top journals for, for publishing and critical gender work and in the context of uh, employment, um, the publishing companies fired the editors and um, disbanded the entire edit academic and editorial staff and replaced the editorship with hand-picked folks um, because they want the articles, um, uh, clearly um, they want to, to dampen the critical nature of the work that's published in those journals. So it's not just the cost, it's not just the gatekeeping, it is also a uh, increasingly, at least, at least in, in my field, increasingly a form of academic censorship um, and, and moving beyond uh, for-profit publishing companies is vital in order to continue to do Democrat, uh, uh, in order to do um, critical research. Um, I, I expect these two are kind of harbingers of more to come and this is a, a you know, really a, a scary moment in higher education academic research when publishing companies are gatekeeping not just um, the costs and, and, and et cetera, but are actually determining um, who that editorial board will be, who can decide what counts as academic work and what counts as publishable work. Um, this is, uh, again, reflecting larger political trends at the state and national level and, and something that we should all be very clear is not serving the values of higher education or democracy. Um, final question from us, and then we'll open it up um, to, to the audience. Uh, President Cantwell's conception of the modern land-grant mission places a strong emphasis on ethical leadership, civic duty, and community service. How can USU ensure that graduates are not only academically prepared to enter the workforce, but also ready to contribute to the betterment of society? Um, how can we ensure our students are ready to enter the workforce, but also are committed to lead positive social change in our communities. And Noah, um, I'll, I'll start with you here. Your, your really important work on sustainability and also your volunteer work in the area of food access. Um, you seem kind of the, the ideal uh, student, right, where you're doing really cutting edge research in, in the area of sustainability and you're contributing to the campus community in really important ways. Can you, can you respond to this? Yeah, absolutely. Um, I think the key word here with this question, at least in my view, um, is involvement. Um, we constantly see as graduate students that we should be hunkering around our desk writing or doing our research or doing literature research and everything, and that's good to a certain extent, but that shouldn't be the five or six years of our tenure here at the uh, State University or any university for that matter. Um, we should go out and get involved um, in our greater campus community and in our greater local community. Um, to see how our um, research or how our studies are actually involved in the community or how they're making an impact. Um, and that really kind of helps, kind of helps um, I think broaden our idea and broaden our appreciation um, for knowledge um, and our studies as a whole. Um, so as you mentioned, um, I volunteer at SNAP, the Student Nutrition Access Center. Um, so my real passion is trying to help um, grow and produce healthy um, sustainable foods um, for local communities. Um, so that's great from a research perspective, but I kind of wanted to see um, a link or another side of that and kind of see um, how we can help um, promote and provide um, nutritional, nutritional and accessible meals um, to our local campus community here, um, our faculty, our staff, and our students. Um, so I took that initiative upon myself um, to become involved with the organization here on campus um, and really enjoyed it. Um, and not only does it give me a break for my studies, um, but it gives me a chance to kind of see a, a broader um, perspective um, of the campus community, what the campus community really looks like, and what kind of my stakeholders or my constituents look like, where my work is actually going to make a difference. 
um, and I can help kind of tie that back um, and have some ideas and how I might direct my own research and what's actually what's valuable. Sure, maybe a basic science question is valuable to a certain extent, but maybe there's this broader societal idea um, that may be a bigger impact coming out of my research. Um, so I think there needs to be a, a bigger emphasis placed on that. Um, undergraduate students, but particularly graduate students. Um, I think there's a lot, the university itself does a, a lot of great work trying to involve undergraduate students. We have a whole office of student involvement here on campus, um, and that's great. I can't necessarily speak to that. I didn't do my undergrad here. Um, but um, as a graduate student, looking at all the other graduate students, I'm looking, wow, you guys have a lot of fun here. There's a lot of cool things uh, to do. I mean, the day on a quad, for example, our annual student activity um, kind of like fair. Um, it's great. There's so many organizations here on campus to get involved. Um, I don't see too many graduates and things like that. We kind of have this stigma, I think, um, that kind of surrounds them. And maybe that has to do with their major advisors um, coming back, trickling down the line, essentially, that, oh, they need to be in the lab, they need to be studying, and no fun, yet, 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 yet. work seven days a week, whatever. Um, I think that we need to kind of try and change that culture. That, yes, this is a job, but you have to get out, be involved, and in, you're still a student, right? Um, you need to be involved in your community, um, particularly when your campus community is really a bit the most out of your education, especially at a land tech university. Sure, I don't know. I'll just add a little bit to that. Um, when I first read that question, I saw the part that says, how can we ensure the graduates? And I thought, oh, that's, that's a tall order, ensuring. I'm not sure we can do that, especially when uh, gross legislation keeps getting passed. Um, and I think one of the things that I had, okay, so, sorry, bring it back. One of the first things that I thought of is that we need to model what we want to see in our students, you know, as, as staff members, as faculty members, as administrators here at Utah State. Um, you know, we can, we can model that by the way, by the way that we engage, by the way that, you know, we see, like, Okay, what activities does the university hold? Which people do they invite to come speak? Like, what? How are we showing our values along along these lines? Um, and I love hearing, you know, when we have things like service learning opportunities and you know, kind of more community engagement where students are. I'm not going to say forced, <laughs> but just where they're given these opportunities, they're given, um, you know, this exposure to see. You know what more is out there beyond just yeah the walls of the classroom or the screen of the classroom. Um, it it has been discouraging to me when I have seen faculty members who do not model these values, um, and I think about the disservice that is that they are doing to their students. But then you know for every faculty member I see who is that way, I see a whole line of other faculty and staff and instructors who just. They, they are just yeah full of, of the desire to help students become who they can become, and they are willing to do so much to make that happen. So they're the ones who give who give me hope that you know eventually some of these others might move on, die out, or whatever <laughs> needs to happen there. Um, and then uh, just one of the things I think about you know from the library perspective is that something I feel we try to do is um, you know, to address students as the whole person. Um, you know, to try to make sure that there are things here that help them to feel seen. And you know, like Rachel Lawyer has been doing these amazing Heritage Month displays and our, our outreach community and, and different groups in the library have created so many amazing opportunities for students to come here or to engage in different ways and to feel that they belong here, that we see them as more than just tuition payers or you know, study bots that you know, we know that they are whole people with whole lives, and we care about that, and we want to help them thrive. Um, let's be friends. <laughs> we have a lot in common. Okay, so, I, I mean, I love your, your thoughts about holistic view. I think one way to get to thinking about what students want and need is, is that community-engaged approach. A lot of times, I think, um, we assume that we know what students need and want, um, and maybe there's research that suggests that, or maybe it's that, well, we've always done like this, so like, why not do it like this? But I think 
what some of the things we learned um, over the past year, we worked with um, the Nutrition, Dietetics, Food Science Department and with SNAC um, and the Transferring Communities Institute and the Department of Social Work to, to study food insecurity among students um, across the state at, at not just Logan, but all of our campuses and to understand what their needs are related to nutrition. And, um, and students are saying, you know, we don't have enough food, but we love snack. They do amazing work, um, continue that. Um, so, you know, investing in those types of resources is clear, they're saying to us, that's important to me. Um, and so I think that community-engaged approach, um, it, it, looking at all the things that impact students, not just um, academics, what they want, or not just activities that they want, but what else do you need to be successful in the work that you do um, here at the university? While you're with us, what can we do to help you? Um, and I don't, I don't know that we're doing that enough. Um, I think the other thing to think about too is our rural campuses and, and really our statewide campuses and understanding that our students at those campuses may be, have, uh, may be different and have uh, different lifestyles or um, have different needs, and so not trying to um, sort of put, like, and there's this model that works for everyone, so how can we make sure that we're adapting to whatever our statewide campuses needs? Um, and then I think, too, we've been talking about community engagement a lot, but, um, you know, students are learning, as they're doing these projects, not only they're learning about the things that are specific to the discipline, but they're also engaging with people who are doing the work that they want to do. So by that, they're learning from professionals, they're learning about, uh, you know, how do I interact with people in this field, what kinds of skills or um, ideals or that, you know, knowledge do I need to be able to be successful. So, um, so it's not just about like, are we doing good work? That's important, but also it's, it's this exposure gives them so much more um, than, than like a traditional classroom approach would give them. But again, that's a lot of work and time for faculty to do, so how do we make sure that we can continue to do that? Thank you so much. I, I, I love what you said, Steph, how are we modeling our values through our programming, through our pedagogy, through our research, through our community engagement, and I, I feel like um, each of you has really reflected some ways in which we can do that moving forward. Uh, with that, I'd like to open it up for questions from, from um, our audience. Again, thank you for being here. I think we've got uh, 15 plus minutes where we can have a, a discussion uh, with everyone. So let me open it up. Questions or comments? Especially comments. <laughs> sitting here thinking of the way I teach resources and how it's very much in this license-based place. And, um, you know, Jamie, you talked about uh, moving. Um, I work with lots of future educators, so they want to do evidence-based practice, and then we put them out in the world, and they don't really know how to get there. And I'm wondering how to capitalize on the availability that USU, that they pay for in their fees to them and teach them um, how to be users of research after they're gone. And I find a lot of the barriers are, if I just had a course where I could focus on anything I want, this would be a section. Um, do you see openings in your curriculums and how, how can librarians and instructors like me do a better job of finding those places where we can talk more about those things? So, I, well, I love librarians, so I, I use you all pretty regularly, but I think especially those who um, are teaching research or um, something like that, I think there's an opportunity to um, help guide uh, sort of the assignments or, you know, the lectures behind how do I digest evidence, how do I digest a scholarly article. Um, because, if I didn't mention this when I was talking about access, a lot of times these articles are not written 
um, in a way that is useful to people who are in the communities doing, you know, who are teaching, who are doing social work, who are do whatever, they're not written that way. So um, working with librarians to help, um, you know, how can we train our students to be able to digest this in a way that's useful to them beyond uh, just reading a 40-page article? Well, they're not going to do that, but how can, how can we do that? So I think um, some outreach to faculty would be really helpful. Um, who, do, who, who teach those courses, um, but then also maybe I think sort of the reverse of like going into the community and and so maybe meeting with educators, maybe meeting with people who are nonprofits. Like, how do you use research? How would you use research if you had it? Asking those kinds of questions are really important, and bringing that back to faculty so that they can incorporate that into their instruction. Other questions or comments um, from Zoom as well. If you want to drop your question in the QRA on Q and A or in the chat, um, we can read that out for you. Oh, another one in the room. So I'm. I feel like impact was a thread through so much of what you all talked about and how we about that more broadly. Well, what does that actually mean? And it's not just about dollar signs um, or a, a number. But Noah, something you said, I think in answer to the very first question, I think you were actually um, referring to a, a conversation with a funder um, and asking them, what's the question, what's the research question you want to answer? And so I I was struck by that. I'm thinking, you know, maybe maybe if we talk more about that, what are the what are the research questions we're trying to answer, and why do they matter, and does that help us get this impact message across? You know, if we're starting, and that's foundational, right? You can't do research if you don't ask the question, like, what is the question you're trying to answer? But if how can we lean into that question in different spaces to maybe help ourselves so we don't feel like we're being our all, all the time on the impact question. I don't know if that if that makes sense or yeah. Anyway. Yeah, it's a really great comment slash question. Um, <clears throat> yeah, we're constantly we, we think that I think we think of ourselves as academics as oh we have all the questions and we want to follow these little paths and stuff. Um, and sure that's great, but the problem is the questions follow, um, but what does our, our broader audience um, want us to follow? What does the community want us to follow? And I think this comes back to being more community engaged, listening to our community, um, listening to the people in our surrounding area, and what do they want help on? Um, the university is here to serve them. Um, so we need to be work on becoming more involved with them and listening to them um, and trying to understand the, the real local um, issues. Um, or problems that um, the local community faces. Um, not only does that help us make um, our research more uh, locally centered, um, but that also helps um, get a greater appreciation um, for the university from the local community. Um, I feel like universities are usually held them in pretty high regard, um, but there's often people that may think that they're kind of all sitting there under ivory tower, why they don't even care about us. Um, we need to be able to be involved with them and engage with um, and try and help them um, um, to basically work together with them to help help use our knowledge um, and use our resources to help get what um, they are, are, are seeking, um, whether that's a question um, or whether that's a process that they're trying to work on. Um, so really being involved um, with them from the basic standpoint, um, and then that can help us, I think, kind of tailor um, our research goals as an R1 institution, still conducting research to a high quality. Um, but the basic idea of where that research stems from, where those questions stem from, um, I think is really important. Um, you brought up funders, so I think this is uh, relevant to this point too. Um, you know, you know, you kind of mentioned this um, in between lines, but as a university, we're in a and faculty, we're in a position of privilege, and so I think that we need to use that privilege and power to help inform funders about the work that they're doing, right? Um, so maybe it's that 
um, hey, perhaps your dollars could like go this direction. And not that will not that that's always going to matter to them, but I do think that as researchers, as um, as teachers, that we do have more influence than a nonprofit or you know community members often do. So I think helping to inform the funding process should be a piece of, of the work that we're doing. Yeah, I'd only add uh, that you know to really make a deep 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 community engaged research questions and, and, and centering community impact would also require, I, I think as we've discussed a little bit, a rethinking of what tenure and promotion look like and what counts. Um, I, I served on Central Tenure and Promotion Committee for two years and I one of the things I observed is that we, we already have a model for evaluating faculty for promotion and tenure that is completely centered on community engagement and impact. And we already have a language for this and pathways for this, and it's an extension. Um, but we have a completely separate set of criteria and processes and, and you know, um, uh, things that count and ways of, 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 of kind of gaining status and, and claiming impact that is for the more traditional research faculty route. Um, it wouldn't be in, in inventing a wheel to merge those models a little bit um, to create the flexibility for faculty that are doing the deep, engaged, community, high-impact work that doesn't look like a traditional academic research track. And I think we would all benefit tremendously from that because by merging those models and creating a more expansive understanding of what research is and what it does and what it looks like, we would have such an edge um, in recruiting and retaining faculty that do that really important work. Um, again, we don't have to invent, we, we don't have to reinvent the wheel. We already have that track. We just have to be creative in, in merging those tracks and, and, and counting the kinds of things that faculty and extension do all across the state that is tremendously high impact, um, but doesn't necessarily count when you're kind of on a research track um, on, on the Logan campus. And I, I think we all lose out for, for not recognizing the way in which those two models should be, should be bridged. Is there a final comment or question? Either in the room or on Zoom. Oh, I see our final question slash comment. <laughs> Okay, comment. You know, I just have to say it's been really interesting hearing your perspectives on all of these issues. Um, you know, I'm a new faculty member, and so some of it is it's still pretty new. But um, I was especially struck by a lot of your comments on making um, various elements of education, the educational process, more accessible um, to a really wide variety of students. And I do think that that um, measuring the impact of some of those those programs and different things can be really challenging. And it made me think of when ages ago, when I was an undergrad um, back in 08, 09, I didn't have a computer. I didn't. Um, I had four jobs, so I'd go to work, come to this, come to school, take a bus. But I found this nice little system at the library. Um, that I could park my car there, and if I left it there after 10, I didn't have to pay for parking. <laughs> so, but there's all these impacts, little things here and there, about obstacles for students to get ahead. And, and when you're trying just to figure out how to get your car there, how to get your work done, um, I had to photocopy all my textbooks because I couldn't afford the textbooks at the library. And um, the impact of the librarians who did the photocopying for me and those little programs that are there. So how do you measure impact when there's not really a, a way to measure it and how do you incorporate these just little creative ways um, of, of getting various students and diverse students access to the programs and education. So it's kind of like my comment question. I don't know if you have additional thoughts. I was really inspired by what you were saying before. So. <laughs> You might need to have a conversation after, because that's just, that's so interesting. Um, it, it is hard. 
I don't have an answer for this. I guess what I will say is that from my own experience, um, when I was working with OER, it was so illuminating to see uh, what we would do during Open Education Week was put up um, a whiteboard and we would ask students you know, to show us, okay, how much are you spending on your materials? And do you ever not purchase your materials because you can't afford them? And most of them would say, yeah, I don't purchase my materials. Um, and then we would see the kinds of things that they would buy. We'd ask them, what would you buy? if you didn't have to worry about paying for textbooks. And it was things like food, gas, all of this. Um, so here's an impact thing for you. We're moving to Aggie Access in the fall. Everybody's up, up on that? Do you all know about that? OK. So there's going to be a, um, a one prize program that the campus store is rolling out starting in fall of 2024 for statewide undergraduate students where all students will automatically be charged $250 for their course materials and and everything including, you know, inclusive access, you know, ebooks or courseware or even uh, print books will just sort of be included in that. And then students will have the option to opt out if that's something that they are able to do. Um, and then, you know, either try to buy their things a la carte or try to go to go alone. Um, I think it's going to be really interesting to see what happens with this because we already know that students don't have $250. A lot of our students don't have $250. Um, to some, this might be a savings, like students who are in the nursing department or the, or the engineering department, but to other students, like in the humanities, they're, they're not going to have it. Um, so, and I'm sorry to sort of so far off of this, but I'm just thinking we're going to have a lot more data coming up soon about, like you said, the little things of how do I actually afford school. Um, and maybe, best case scenario, this will be what helps uh, USU to really invest more in um, you know, the library as a player in providing educational materials. Maybe this will really ramp up the OER program. Maybe this will really ramp up us having the money to purchase um, you know, unlimited user textbooks, ebooks so that students can have those, instructors can choose those things, which could then bring down the cost of that average $250. Or maybe it'll go the other way, where faculty will hear all the upselling messages and think, well, if it's all included, let's get like the Rolls Royce with all the courseware attached, and then students don't have the option to opt out of that. So I think it will be, it will be interesting to see if this, if, yeah, for which students does this end up being a help and for which students does it end up hurting and how, how do we adapt and how do we see where we can fill in those gaps and, and with while getting feedback from students about what is actually going to push the needle for them. Yeah. One thing I know we're at time. Um, ask the students. We gave five, a $5 gift card to ask the, how do they feel about snack and its utility and, and how did it impact their life? We had, I don't know, I think like 1,600 students take that within a couple of days. Five dollars. So ask them. It, measuring impact is not as complex as we make it out to be. It may not be um, exact always, but there are tools to help inform measuring impact of different aspects. And also, being able to assess the need among students, we need to ask them. That's a good place to end. Ask students what they need. Yeah, it's great. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much.